All right, guys, we are reading through John F. Kennedy's book, Stolen Identity, Unveiling the Real John Kennedy Jr. And um, if you want to catch up, go back a few videos to the very beginning. I've tried to number them one, two, three, four, five. I think we're on six right now. This is book three, and we are on page 92. If you do want to order this book, go on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon, also Barnes & Noble. And then John also goes live on TikTok, um, YouTube. Probably the best place to find him is on YouTube at John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. To spell it all out, even the word junior. All right. <clears throat> 1975, The Darkest Chapter. <clears throat> After Alexander's death... I returned to the Quigleys while Jackie and Aristotle carved out a domain in Bullhead City, Arizona, a small desert town nestled along the Colorado River. They strategically acquired the town, placing their people in every available house. Then in 1975, when I was 15 years old, I was picked up from the Quigleys and brought there. My heart got lighter with every mile we traveled. Finally, I was getting away. My joy even grew when the landscape transformed from the, from the lush greenery and palm tree lined and palm tree lined roads to arid brown soil punctuated by clusters of thorny shrubs, sucking the last remnants of moisture from the dusty earth. <clears throat> In the late afternoon, the car pulled up in front of a modest vanilla ranch style home atop a hill boasting a gently sloping lawn adorned with a few palm trees. The inside was filled with lavish furnishings for a larger, grander home. Aristotle boasted about how he had installed air conditioning and we talked about changing our names and starting again. Jackie envisioned a life where I could work in a garage fixing cars. She was excited to start a new life with her family and forget about all the criminal corruption. But out of caution, they arranged for a camper trailer near the service station, my potential refuge in case I needed to hide out. At first, it seemed like it would work out Jackie and Aristotle liked the desert. They were nudists and enjoyed taking off their clothes and walking around in the hot, dry air. There was a movie theater in the town where many Hollywood stars came to practice and audition, even though it didn't have power. Actors, producers, and directors gathered in the building at night and put on productions using candles and reflectors to eliminate the stage. I remember many people being there who to this day are big Hollywood stars. One day I was sitting by the ravine in the middle of the desert using a kit I had to pan for gold. It was dead quiet except for the sound of burbling water, buzzing insects, and the occasional whisk of a lizard darting through the grass. Suddenly a handful of kids came walking towards me. They ranged in age from about 8 to 18. The eldest was a boy holding a video recorder. He was a smart ass. He said, we're from Hollywood. We're making a movie and you're not invited. I shrugged and returned to my panning. It seemed weird, but I was used to weirdness. It wasn't until I got home that I saw what kind of movie they had been making. My stepfather, Aristotle Onassis, lay dead in the side yard, covered by a bloody sheet, having been bludgeoned repeatedly with a camping axe that now lay next to his body. The kids were gone, but about four agents were standing there discussing what they would do and how they would send him back to Greece. I wanted to go over to Aristotle, but they held me back. One of them picked up the ax. I started crying uncontrollably. I couldn't believe Aristotle, a powerful, forceful man who seemed invincible, lay dead and lifeless under that sheet. 
All my hopes and dreams for the future bled out of me like the seeping red stain on the sheet and grass. I waited for someone to come over and say something to me, but they ignored me, and their voices blended like the buzz of the cicadas just before dark. It was typical mob tactics. I realized with despair. Each kid probably had to take a turn hitting Aristotle with the axe while that older boy videotaped it. That way, the mafia would have a murder rap on all those kids who would later become Hollywood movie stars and money makers for the syndicate. My mother came home later and what happened next was blocked from my memory. Sometimes screams are soundless, like the echoing silence after a sonic boom. <clears throat> Amidst the grief and pandemonium that followed, Jackie was scared something would happen to me, so she told me to hide in a local restaurant. In a secluded room, I overheard the restaurant owner speaking in a frightened voice on the phone. I don't want him here. He comes here all the time. They'll know he's here. The next day, the restaurant burned to the ground, and I relocated to my trailer next to the service station. Then Jackie sent me to Greenwich, Connecticut, Greenwich, Connecticut, to stay with some Kennedys. I was at a house I'd been to before, where the Kennedy kids were always mean to me. One Kennedy boy, a real nasty kid, would routinely pummel me, so I hated going there. That day, about six of us kids were playing Monopoly in the house. An elderly bald man in his 60s came in with a golf club and beckoned us to follow him outside. Come on, kids, he said. They all got up to follow him as if the whole thing had been uh, prearranged, but then he turned around and pointed at me. Not you, kid. You stay in the house. Feeling singled out and excluded, I waited for them to leave before settling on the sofa, sensing that something was off. Suddenly, a truck pulled up to the house. I went outside to see who it was, and a federal agent instructed me to get inside. Behind the wheel sat another agent. The in, and inside the truck were my mother and a man with a gun pointed at her head. Paralyzed with terror, my heart thudded. I looked at her, unable to utter a word. Fear gleamed in her eyes as they darted nervously between me and the road ahead. We drove to a yard where a girl's body lay beneath a pine tree, her long blonde hair obscuring her face. A broken, bloody golf club lay beside her in the grass. A federal agent held me by one arm, pointed at the body and said, that's your sister. I felt like someone threw me into a swirling tunnel of insanity. Everything was moving around me, but I was at, as still as a footprint in the grass as anger, grief, and horror coursed silently through me. At the same time, I was niggling since uh, I was I had a niggling sensation of someone of something like deja vu. I thought I've seen this before, done this before. MK Ultra sometimes involves repetition. This scene was replayed twice. The first time I was in an MK trance state hearing discussions about placing a body as if the agents there were setting up a crime scene and planting ideas in my head. They may have shown me my actual sister's dead body or a convincing look-alike. The thought was quickly jettisoned from my mind when the federal agent said, now here's what you're going to do, kid. You're going to pick up that golf club and stab your sister with it, or else we'll kill your mother. I'll be waiting in the truck. He walked away, and I stood there, my insides he heaving. I knew I couldn't do it. I thought, I'll just tell them I did it. I returned to the truck, and when I got in, 
I went completely wild. I leaped over my mother and scratched the agent's face, screaming and crying hysterically. They tried to calm me down, but I went completely nuts. When the Martha Moxley murder story broke in the news, I was convinced that it was that it was my sister and that Martha Moxley was her undercover name in the witness protection program. For years, I never questioned the idea. Martha Moxley was my dead sister. I went crazy that day, and that notion stayed with me for many years. They wanted me to believe it, and it, it, it isn't easy to understand why. Perhaps they wanted me never to wonder or investigate what happened to my real sister. In the panic and hysteria that followed Aristotle's murder and the Martha Moxley incident, my mother was sure I was next on the hit list and asked Wayne if he could get me out of the, out of the country to keep me safe. I don't know what they were thinking, and I, as I said, these people operate in a world of crazy. But it was decided that Wayne would take me to Vietnam. We drove to an airfield where uniformed personnel were heaving sacks of mail into the belly of an army cargo plane. Wayne told me to climb on top of the canvas sacks and then he settled into the cockpit. We flew for hours. Finally, we landed on a dirt runway nestled in the dense jungle. Wayne indicated a group of soldiers and said, go with these guys. They're going to teach you everything. He pointed a warning finger at me and added, and whatever happens, don't tell anyone who you are. From that point, the soldiers taught me all the skills to help me stay alive in the jungle, like using a knife to cut off branches. I remember eating army food, which was terrible, like cardboard. Eventually, we met up with their unit and went out on parole patrol. They said, don't ever talk, don't ever question, just shut your mouth or we'll kill you, another guy added. Tommy was a wiry kid with hard eyes. He liked to kill, kill people with his long machete. When it got covered with blood, he licked it off and said, I like to taste my enemies. One day, we were all eating lunch beside a pile of dead bodies. The soldiers were going through their pockets, through their packs, and one of them pulled out a bundle of leather straps. This guy's father was a congressman, and he said his dad told him to always have a bunch of these straps on hand because they come in handy. Tommy looked at him and nodded. Then he handed me his pocket knife and said, Hey, kid, go cut the ears off those bodies over there. I knew I had to do it. I had to do everything they told me. I put my foot on the ground in slow motion, stood up and walked over with the pocket knife. Don't think, I told myself. And I started cutting off the ears and placing them in a neat pile. The funny thing about cutting off other people's ears is that you can't hear anything out of your own. Just a loud roaring sound like the wind blowing on fire. I jumped when I felt something thin, like snake-like fall around my neck. When I jerked my head around, Tommy was standing there grinning. He said, we'll make you an ear necklace. He took the ears I'd already cut off, slid the leather strap through them, and tied it off before hanging it around my neck. As he turned to walk away, he said over his shoulder, keep cutting. After I'd cut off a few more, the commander came by and asked what we were doing. You can't do that, he said. You have to put those ears back. He shook his head slowly as if pondering the situation. After a sigh, he unbuttoned his breast pocket and pulled out a small plastic case. Snapping it open, he said, you know how to sew, kid. I shook my head and shivered despite the, the heat and humidity. The commander inclined his, his head for me to watch him as he, sh as he took out a needle and thread from the case and sewed an ear back on. 
The only thing was, and I guess this was meant to be the funny part, he sewed it on backwards. I took a deep breath and bent over the dead earless bodies. Then I started sewing those ears back on the heads backward, my ear necklace bouncing against my chest as I worked. There was a big commotion while I was doing that and everyone started getting their gear together quickly. We headed off through the jungle and as we passed some bushes, one of the soldiers gave me a shove and said, get under there, don't make a sound. Don't come out until we come for you. I scrambled under the bush terrified as shots, shells, and shouts sounded in the distance. Day grew into night and no one came for me. Eventually, the sounds of fighting died down, but I was, not, I was too terrified to move. I stayed under there most of the next day. By this time, I had pissed and shit myself and my legs were numb. Finally, an eerie silence fell over the area, punctuated by an occasional far-off voice echo, but I couldn't tell if it was American or Vietnamese. Eventually, I heard a helicopter, and the thought twanged into my head like a released arrow. It's now or never. Grunting with the pain of trying to move my deadened legs, I rolled out from under the bush and ran toward the helicopter. My brain was so scattered that I didn't know who I was or what I was doing. After seeing all the dead bodies, Tommy licking the knife and then putting the ears on a rope, all I could do was run to the chopper. I didn't know if it was ours or theirs, but I knew I couldn't stay where I was. Even if it's Vietnamese, I thought, either way, I'm dead. I ran across an open field, waving my arms. Hey, wait, wait for me. <clears throat> As I got closer, I could see three American choppers and my body flooded with relief. I didn't care that they pointed their rifles at me. I just kept running toward them. As I got closer, they lowered their weapons. I made it to the nearest chopper and the soldiers stared at me, frozen and wide-eyed like I was a mirage. Only when I reached them did I realize I was an actual kid. Did they realize that I was an actual kid with crapped in pants and wearing an ear necklace running through a jungle war zone? One said, what the hell are you doing here, kid? I shook my head, too breathless to speak, and they pulled me on board. I lay panting on the floor as the chopper took off. The pilot kept running his head, turning his head around to look at me. He said, who are you? You're just a little kid. I shook my head and said, I don't know. He said, well, don't worry about it, okay? We'll find out who you are and your family, but you're one of us now, okay? We reached an army base and the pilot took me to the commander's tent. I sat in a chair across from his desk, feeling numb with disbelief. Everything was a blur. The commander looked at me with narrowed, disbelieving eyes. Who are you, he asked. I was so scatterbrained, I didn't know who I was. I said, I honestly don't know. He shook his head and said, well, we'll get this figured out. Meanwhile, you need to get some clean clothes on and get rid of that necklace. In my shocked state, I clutched the necklace defensively and shook my head. The commander said I could make a new necklace by collecting discarded peel tops from beer and soda cans that littered the base. I was there for a few days. They gave me a uniform that didn't fit. So I used rubber bands to hold it down and walked around the base, picking up soda tops for my necklace. The guys there were all trying to figure out why I was there, who I came with, and how I got there. After a few days, a government agent came to me, someone I'd never seen before. I was flown back to the States and back to Bullhead City. I had only been home a few weeks when my mother Jackie was murdered. 
We were sitting in the garage as I worked changing tires. We talked about how we would move and start our lives over. My mother said, it won't be easy, but I really want to start a new life with you. We can do it. You can work in a garage and we can make a living and do our own thing. We'll be our own little family. She spoke with a glassy-eyed, faraway look that unsettled me despite the comforting and reassuring words. She was in the daze, and I could tell she, still, she was still recovering from a, we, a recent breakdown. Then she walked into the office area adjacent to the garage. The next thing I knew, I heard shots. Pop, pop, pop. Racing outside, I saw her laying in a pool of blood and I screamed and tried to run over to her. I wanted to gather her in my arms, but a government agent appeared out of nowhere, grabbed me by the arm and pressed a gun to my head. Another agent came from behind and they forced me into a station wagon where I saw a little girl I had met the day before, but couldn't recall who she was. We drove to an office building that resembled a police station and they brought me to a room with desks and a table. I was shocked and crying hysterically, but the two agents were oblivious. Seated at a table, they calmly discussed the profits from the murder, which involved stocks and shares in Kellogg and General Mills. And then one of them walked over and put a piece of paper in front of me. He said, this is a confession saying you killed your mother. I want you to sign it. I shook my head, still crying and screamed, no, no. A dark haired muscular man in a suit barged into the office just then. He had a gun in one hand and a badge in the other. He said, I'm taking this kid. He grabbed me and dragged me out of the building and into his car. We drove around for days. I never saw anyone so scared in my life. He kept driving in circles. My heart sank when we pulled up in front of the Quigleys. I stumbled out of the car, stared blearily at the house and collapsed to my knees, burying my head in the dirt and throwing fistfuls of it over my head. Tears streamed down my face uncontrollably. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I had lost my entire family to murder, only to return to my stepfamily, who treated me like shit. All right. The next chapter, Adolescent Escapades. So we're on page 106. Be sure and pick up your own copy of John's book. A Stolen Identity by John Kennedy Jr. You can also follow him on YouTube at John Kennedy, John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. Write the whole thing out, even the word junior, okay? It's the best thing to do. Start following him yourself and make up your own mind. That every, there's so much that they lie to us about, okay? All right, Adolescent Escapades. I have only scattered memories of the years immediately following 1975. I was enrolled in Yosemite High School, but hardly ever went. I was always off doing other things. When school started, I didn't bother to go the first week. And when I did turn up, they wanted an excuse as to why I hadn't been there for the first week. So I didn't go the next two weeks either. Over the years, I went to school on and off, but never seriously. During my time there, I mostly hung out at the picnic benches located on the hill and other kids who were skipping class or just looked to relax, looking to relax would join. Despite Yosemite Lakes being known for its crazy weirdness, it was also a chill community where teenagers could easily buy cigarettes and those of us skipping class would gather to smoke and play happy sack. If there were a class I liked, such as shop where we worked on cars, I would go to school. 
There was also a history teacher I admired. We often discussed politics. One day he took me aside and said, I don't even know why I'm letting you go. You hardly attend school, but I'm just going to pass you along. But when I attended math class after a long absence, the teacher said, you don't show up here and you're going to fail this class. I stood to walk out and he said, I don't really need to come to your class. And I said, I really don't need to come to your class. Instead of attending school, I took on various odd jobs doing anything to earn a buck. I loved to fix up old motorcycles and tear through the wind with my stereo blaring. I worked for $2 an hour restoring old Model A's and T's. I dug ditches, drove trucks, and worked, on construct, worked in construction. At one point, I was employed as a construction and maintenance worker in the gated community where we lived. My duties included sweeping gutters and filling in potholes. Later, I worked as a roofer, and eventually I got a job in construction with Max Quigley's real estate partner, Armand, where I learned how to build a house from the ground up. Armand had 10 or 12 stepkids, and they all conspired on what happened next. One of the kids, Darren Price, invited me over. While hanging out, smoking pot and drinking beer, Darren's brother, Donnie's girlfriend, mentioned, I need a pack of cigarettes from the store. I offered her a ride in my car, and she said casually, where's your gun at? In the back of my mind, I knew I was set up, but against my better judgment, I agreed to ride in her car instead of my own, where my gun lay hidden under the seat. The mini mart was only a few blocks away. Standing in line to pay, I felt a chill, a chill as a Mexican guy sidled up beside me and another crept up from behind. Trying to keep my cool, I paid for my cigarettes, stepped outside onto the sidewalk facing the parking lot, and suddenly one of the guys stepped in front of me, blocking my path. Craning my neck, I saw a few more guys coming toward us. In a guttural whisper, the guy behind me said, we're taking you out back to kill you. I put my arm on his shoulder, gave him a big smile, and punched him in the mouth so hard his feet left the ground. Two guys grabbed me by the arms as he hit the ground, and another swung a crowbar into my stomach. Intense pain surged, but I was pumped with rage and adrenaline. There was a crash of fists, wrenches, and, crow and the crowbar, and I was beating them back. Amid the chaos, I saw Donnie's girlfriend sitting in her car with the engine idling, watching me get beat up with glazed eyes like she was watching TV. I screamed at her, just get the fuck out of here. It took her a second to come out of her daze and realize I was talking to her. Finally, she snapped out of it and I ran to get in the passenger seat. Her tires squealed as we, as we pulled out. I hurt so bad after that, bruised and battered. But when I returned to work the next day, Max and Armand laughed at me. I was in so much pain that I couldn't even work, but they laughed. Following everything that had happened, it seemed appropriate to wear my dead Kennedy's t-shirt whenever possible. And that's what I was wearing one particular day when I was out of the boat out at the boat dock at Yosemite Lakes. Ted Kennedy and Maria Shriver showed up with federal agent who no doubt located me because of my chip. I don't know if these were real Kennedys or if they had already been replaced. After so much trauma, the line between reality and potential replacements gets blurred. Maria got mad at me because of my shirt, saying it was disrespectful. I tried to explain that it was the name of a punk rock band that sings about social justice. Still, 
Ted dismissed my protest, saying it was a pot, I was a pothead and therefore he wouldn't bring me out into the public as the real John Kennedy Jr. I think if he were the real, uh, any real family member, he would have died trying to get me out. If it were me and I knew a family member was in trouble, I would die to help that person. When I was 17, I had a girlfriend named Angela. We met at school and were seeing each other. I even tattooed her name on my arm. Then one morning when I was getting ready to go to school, Max stopped me and said, you're not going to school today. You're getting on a plane and going to Canada. So I threw some clothes in a bag and boarded a plane for Edmonton, Alberta to stay with my sister, Deborah Quigley. Her husband, Jerry Van Dyke, was in the Secret Service and his brother, John, was an awesome guitar player who had me writing songs. Songwriting ability is a perk that comes from being in MK Ultra, and Max often used me for the same purpose. I'm sure Jerry knew about me when he asked me to write songs for him, and I was happy to do it anyway. I created lyrics like, Mama, I Want to Come Home, and other songs. Jerry told me he knew somebody who wanted my music and would pay me. It turned out that that person was Ozzy Osbourne. Ozzy started singing, Ozzy started singing my song Crazy Train and Mama I'm Coming Home. I wrote those songs, but I never got paid and I never got credit. I was in Edmonton for a year. The winter was long and cold, but since I was laid up after a bad motorcycle crash, I was okay with staying home and watching TV or playing Atari. After I healed, I, had a girl, I got a girlfriend who was twice my age. She had a Corvette and would sneak me into bars, even though I was underage. When it got warmer, I rode my skateboard all over the city, getting to know Edmonton. I kept calling and asking to come home, but Max and Dorothy said no, and I had to stay there a while longer. I never found out why, but something was going on. When I finally came back to California, Angela had disappeared. I never saw her again. When Max saw the tattoo, he was, he was furious. There couldn't be any distinguishing marks that would allow people to di differentiate between me and John John. So I removed it myself in my room using a candle and an X-Acto knife. I thought, welcome home, welcome back to Crazy Train. Max Jr. was completely insane. He tried to have me killed one time. We were driving around in his black Lincoln visiting different friends of his. One of his friends was a federal agent who went by Steve as a civilian and Victor as an agent. Victor was a screwball character who spoke about 20 languages and was a master of disguise. Once he and Max Jr. took me through a shopping mall. We wound our way through a labyrinth of departments and hallways and ended up in a hidden room, an FBI office filled with desks and agents. Victor once even swore me into the Secret Service. He recorded the whole thing on a reel-to-reel, -reel, <clears throat> which is out there somewhere. He also put a little tattoo on my side, just a series of little dots, and, the, and said, This is the Little Dipper. If you ever end up dead, that's how we'll be able to identify the body. But on this particular day, Victor tried to kill me, or at least pretended to. I hadn't seen him in a while. Max Jr. took me to his house, and he had long hair and was dressed like a hippie. That guy was a man of a thousand faces. When I first met him, he was had a crew cut and looked like an FBI man, but he could look Mexican one day and white the next. He had a young kid with him, maybe 15, and they got in, a, in the car with us. We drove for a while and wound up at the airport. I saw warehouses and a dumpster 
we got out of the car and I could hear the roar of the jets taking off and the whine as they landed. But then it was dark and I was standing in front of the dumpster when the young kid and Victor pulled out guns. Victor was standing behind the kid and he, and he pointed a gun at my head. Max started rapping on the car's hood, shaking his head, nervous and jittery. He said, hurry up and shoot this son of a bitch so we can get out of here. Suddenly, a car pulled into the driveway across from us and beamed at us with its headlights. We lit up like we were under a spotlight. Seeing it, Victor yelled at the kid, no, don't shoot him. The kid put the gun away and got in the car. The lights from the car across the way were still fixed on us, piercing through the darkness like a warden's eyes. Max got in the car, but Victor stood frozen behind the wood pallets. I walked over to him and told him I had a gun, which I did, tucked inside my belt. I looked at him in the eye and said, I'm going to win this battle and you know it. My head was spinning and I didn't know what else to do, so I returned to the car. I thought, I can't believe I'm getting back in the car with this crazy mother. The car took off and the next thing I knew, we were pulling up to a nice brick house with white pillars on the porch. I looked around, wondering how the day could get any weirder. Where the hell were we now? We got out and went inside the house and there, sitting on the tapestried armchair, was Betty Ford. She said, hello, I'm Betty Ford. I said, it's nice to meet you, and that was it. I returned to the car, combing my fingers through my hair, completely scattered and freaking out. By the time we returned to the Quigleys, it was three in the morning, and I came storming in. I woke up Max and Dorothy and said, there was just an attempt on my freaking life. What the hell is going on? I know you guys knew about it. They said, well, you shouldn't have gone with your brother in the first place. I don't know if that car showed up just in time to save me as a result of Wayne tracking me through my chip or if it was because Victor was really a double agent. All I know is that people have been watching over me and keeping me alive all these years. All righty, we're going to close this one off for now and be sure and go pick up John's book. And follow him on YouTube at John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. Um, and um, yeah, Amazon or Barnes & Noble. He looks like his daddy when his daddy was younger, in my opinion. All right, y'all have a blessed day. We'll see you on the next video.